All right. Um, anyway, where are we? Well, we're still in the part of the course where I'm sort of doing a job, and that is where I have to teach you about mainstream philosophy of mind. There is, if you pick up the philosophy journals, uh, there is a sort of standard set of problems that keep coming up over and over. And the favorite problem is uh, the mind-body problem. What's the relationship between the mind and the body, particularly uh, what about consciousness? And I haven't really talked about it because I haven't so far told you what I think. I've told you what everybody else thinks. Now, I've told you some negative things I think. I think that uh, the computational model of the mind is just hopelessly mistaken for reasons that I've spelled out. And you will have a chance both in your papers and on the exam uh, to tell me why I'm mistaken about that. But in any case, you ought to know what the uh, position is. Now, last time we went through uh, several important uh, positions. And it's always a good idea in philosophy to step back and ask yourself, well, why do we have this issue? What's the puzzle anyway? Why, and why do these, what seem on the face of it, kind of implausible answers, why do they become so influential and so widespread? I think we have uh, the puzzle because we want to account for ourselves. We want to give a science, we want to have a science of human beings and human cognition, which is somehow part of natural science. But we don't really see how to do that because the feature about, that seems so special about humans is their consciousness. They have these conscious states. And that's just hard to stomach. And it's hard to square that with our contemporary scientific religion. I call it a religion because it's kind of taken for granted. Everybody accepts it, which is a kind of materialism. I, we're sort of brought up to believe that, well, basically, in the end, everything is matter. It all comes down uh, to uh, molecules or uh, uh, atomic molecular uh, atoms or subatomic particles, but basically it comes down to the entities of uh, physics and chemistry, and we don't see how to fit these uh, spooks, ghosts, minds, feelings, qualia. How the hell is all that supposed to fit in with how the world is or how we think we know it is anyway? And the answer, and most, mostly the answers that uh, I, I've been asking you to read and I've been talking about, I think are wrong answers to that question, but that's what drives them, is, is it looks like we've got to give an answer uh, to the question, which comes out as materialism. Materialism is sort of the religion of the educated people in the present era. Uh, and it's, I guess it's my religion, too. I mean, I was brought up like the rest of you, and I think, yeah, what they told me in, in physics is basically right. Now, I do wish they'd get their act together. I've told you this before, and I've told my professional physicist friends that I like their discipline better when they were happy with electrons, protons, and neutrons. And I'm sick of quarks and leptons and muons, but if that's what, that's what I'm paying them to do. If that's what they come up with, okay, then that's what they come up with. Now they've got onto these damn strings, and I don't understand the strings because I don't know the math. But anyway, I'm paying those guys to get, get their act together, okay? That's not my job, but whatever. Uh, the story is they're the ones who are going to tell us about how big things are made out of little bitty things. But now if you tell that story about how big things are made out of little bitty things, then there doesn't seem to be any room for uh, minds, consciousness, ghosts, uh, qualia, uh, spirits, or any of the other things that seem to crop up. Now it looked like the computer to the rescue. We're going to have a computational theory that will solve all of our problems. And at the one, on the one hand, it's materialistic because it gives an account of the mind uh, in terms that we are familiar with from physics. After all, the computer is a physical system. But at the same time, it satisfies this instinct we have uh, to think that the mind is something abstract, that it's not a sort of uh, a concrete entity. Uh, and the answer is, it is abstract, but it's abstract in a way the computer program is abstract. That the computer program can be specified independently of the physics of its realization. Now, I think in a hundred years' time, 
I, if the intellectuals at that in that period find our find it possible to look at us at all without uh, being in pain, if they find our sight endurable, they will wonder why on earth were those people so obsessed with this dumb computational model? The idea that the brain is a digital computer uh, uh, and the mind is a computer program, well, that takes about five minutes to refute. That is, if you're uh, lecturing to beginning philosophers, it takes me five minutes to refute. Uh, but I think part of the frenzy of the attacks on me, and, and there, some of them are kind of fun to read. At the time, they weren't so much fun, but you get all of them in the reader. There's uh, the initial 27 uh, responses uh, to my original article. I, I think people will, will be puzzled uh, that there ever was uh, so much of a problem anyway, because you wouldn't think that about anything else. Nobody would say, well, look, the way to understand the stomach is to see that it's really a digital computer. And what we got to do is find the computer program by which it digests pizza, because that's a tough program. Uh, <laughs> see, nobody's going to think that. It's crazy. But, but if you take seriously uh, the, what I think is obviously the case, the brain is an organ like any other, and it functions on, on a, a biological principles like any other organ. And nobody, we don't have a stomach digestion problem. You know, my God, are you a stomach digestion functionalist? Or do you go with Australian type type identity theory? The stomach just is digestion. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, I know, or, or, or do you go with the MIT computational view? The stomach we've discovered is a digital computer, and we're now discovering the computations that the stomach performs in order to uh, digest not just pizza, but uh, all of the dreadful seafood that you can get in the MIT area. Okay, now, nobody thinks that, and I think it's just as silly to think the way to understand the brain is the same. But it, I, the reason that it appealed, I think, is put by Dan Dennett when he said, well, we now know the mind is something formal or abstract. Well, people might think that if their idea of the mind is solving problems in calculus. But how about the parts of the mind where you want to go to the bathroom, let's say, or I, I, I won't go through all the sordid things that don't seem very abstract. Uh, but in any case, there are all sorts of features of my mind that I don't think are, for, uh, are formal or abstract, like feeling a hangover the next day. Uh, so there are, <clears throat> I, the picture that I want to give you is that in an odd kind of way, the computational theory of mind was a weird marriage of materialism and dualism. Uh, on the one hand, it says we're going to have a materialist reduction, but on the other hand, it says, but of course we've discovered what we know from Descartes anyway, that the mind isn't the name of a physical pro process, it's the name of an abstract process, an abstract formal process, an algorithmic process that we can implement on a physic on a in a brain or indeed in any other hardware system that's stable enough uh, to carry the program now this was uh, very important historically because it came at a time when cognitive science was being founded and cognitive science i think is uh, the most exciting area now in the study of the mind and again intellectual historians will wonder how did the psychologists let it get away that is, there were existing psychology departments. Why did cognitive science break off as a separate discipline? I don't know the answer to that, but I think part of it is the, the psychology departments just got too damn big. I mean, there were, they were branches of, of um, a, a clinical psychology and educational psychology and all kinds of stuff. I, I have professionals here in the front row actually know about that. I'm not going to let them give today's lecture. But anyway, that's an interesting speculation, is why did we tear uh, cognitive science away from mainstream psychology. Uh, also, another reason I think is that uh, uh, behaviorism was still influential. I, I think it's pretty much dead now, but it was still influential when cognitive science got going. And, and basically, cognitive science was created by a whole lot of people, a lot of them philosophers, who just got sick of behaviorism in, in uh, uh, psychology and wanted a, a more scientifically profound conception of the study of the human mind. In fact, they wanted to be able to say, we are studying the human mind instead of saying we're studying human behavior or stimulus response patterns or something like that. So anyway, that happened, but the computational model was 
very influential, and it still is in some quarters, and there are certain aspects of it that I didn't go over enough. So we might start this morning by doing them, and then I'm going to go on with some other aspects, other ways of solving or approaching or failing to solve the mind-body problem. So uh, uh, for, uh, I mean, for those of you who taking, uh, who like to take notes, bless you all. I don't have any notes, so um, I, I hope somebody's keeping track. Uh, I'm going to talk, I'll talk some more about uh, what I called last time cognitivism, that is uh, the idea that though the computer program isn't sufficient for having a mind, it is at least necessary for having a mind. And the uh, study of the operation of the program is essentially the science of the mind because mental processes are computational processes, and they're computational processes that operate over the syntax, over the formal structure of mental states. Yes, we agree there is a semantics that goes along for the ride, but the real work is computational. And that's, a, I just have a label, I call that cognitivism. Uh, because it says, yes, it's true, the syntax isn't sufficient for the semantics, but all the same, scientifically speaking, the brain is a syntactical engine, and mental processes are computational processes operating over the formal structure, over the syntactical structure of uh, uh, brain states, of, of uh, mental states. Uh, and that is, I think, still uh, influential. Now then, another thing I want to get to this morning is connectionism. Uh, and that, again, was a very influential for a while. My impression is it's kind of died out because after the usual pattern is you get, you get some initial results and a tremendous burst of enthusiasm. Uh, and then after the burst of enthusiasm, it kind of, the, pro, the research project doesn't really succeed. Okay, so let's go through that. Uh, any questions before I launch into all that? I'm going to talk about a whole lot of stuff uh, this morning. Okay, here we go. Um, cognitivism. The picture that these guys have is that, yes, we can grant that the computer program isn't all there is to having a mind, be because we know that in order to have a mind, you have to have some content that goes along with a syntax, uh, have some semantics in addition to the syntax, but the syntax is at least the essential scientific component of the operation of the mind because mental processes are syntactical computational processes. That is, they're computational and thus by definition they're syntactical because the program only operates over the formal or the syntactical structure of the states. Uh, and indeed, what you have in the brain are a set of symbolic representations and the mental processes go from one of these representations to another. Now, there were certain classic works uh, that were supposed to illustrate this, and I guess the most famous was David Marr's book, uh, Vision. That's spelled M-A-R-R. -R. Um, and Marr was an Englishman who was at MIT who died tragically very young. Uh, the book is called Vision, and it's actually I was published in San Francisco, I forget, I think Freeman was the name of the publisher, but in any case, it's readily obtainable. And it's very interesting how he thinks of vision. I, it seems to me totally unrealistic. He thinks the problem of the visual system is that the system has to take information about a two-dimensional array on the retina and then convert it into a three-dimensional description of the external world. So you have a series of processes, and he describes these as a construction of the, of the primal image, and then the 2.5D image, and then the 3D representation. But it's always put in terms of descriptions. Now, I think that's not what the visual system does. The visual system takes in a series of impulses, that is to say, photons. It takes in a series 
of electrical uh, stimulations of the photoreceptor cells. And then by a whole lot of processes, it converts those into an actual conscious visual experience. That's what, why vision is so much fun. At the end, you have not a description, you have an actual visual experience that has intrinsic intentionality. It has intentional content. So it isn't a question of the visual system producing a description. I don't get a description of you when I look at you. What I get is the actual perception of real people and places and things uh, and objects and states of affairs in the world. But the idea was that we'll be able to do a science of vision without actually knowing too much about the actual mechanics of the visual system. Who wants to know what happens in the lateral geniculate nucleus and, and, uh, and what happens in between V1 and V4? V1 is the visual area of the brain at the very, at the uh, visual area one, which is the back of the skull. It used to be called Brodmann area 17. And V4 is, we think, specialized for color. And there are all these exciting, I think, exciting things, details about how the brain actually works to produce conscious visual experiences. But the picture that the cognitivist had was, no, it's all a computational process, and what it produces is a symbolic structures. It produces a symbolic description. I think that's just psychologically wrong. A, 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 a clue that there's something fishy is Marr has nothing to say about color. But of course, uh, unless you are colorblind, uh, and even there, you get some kinds of color experience. Uh, it's essential uh, to our visual experiences that we have these marvelous color experiences. But in any case, uh, the idea uh, was, and, and it's not, it isn't that people thought, well, we're going to adopt cognitivism as opposed to strong AI. Nobody ever used jargon like that. I invented the term uh, strong AI uh, uh, because people in, who actually work in the field didn't make these distinctions. They just thought, well, we're, we're creating minds and we're going to figure out how the, uh, the brain actually works to produce mental phenomena, and we know before we ever get started that that's computational, and so now we're just going to design the programs. And what I try to do was challenge that whole picture. The program by itself is not sufficient. Um, I'll take questions in a minute. But then the, uh, the, <coughs> uh, the next step was, and I didn't explain this very well on uh, Tuesday, and that is, well, how do you get, supposing you agree with me, that the program by itself, just the set of steps in the program, is not sufficient for having mental contents. If you agree with that, but you think all the same, mental processes are computational processes, and they operate over the formal structure of uh, mental states. They operate over symbolic representations. Uh, if uh, you, you think that, then it looks like you've avoided the objections of the Chinese room argument, and it looks like you've still got one of the attractive features of the computational model. Namely, you can do a science of the mind without knowing in the actual sordid details of how the brain works. You don't actually have to worry about the, uh, about the, the uh, a structure of the Perkin J cells and the, and the different kinds of neurons in the different portions of the brain. All you have to do is think about the, the computational level. Now, I did briefly criticize that on Tuesday, and I want to criticize it some more. OK, so let's, let me just summarize briefly where we are. I'm assuming now that I've refuted strong AI. I've refuted computer functionalism. And it's a one-sentence refutation. Uh, the syntax is not sufficient for the semantics. Syntax, uh, the semantics is not intrinsic to the syntax. And the deeper philosophical point is that the simulation is not duplication. You don't create something by doing a computer simulation of it. The computer simulation is a model or a picture. So that's the summary. But now then, we're still left with a version of computationalism uh, which says all the same, the brain is a syntactical engine and mental processes are syntactical computational processes. And a lot of people, I think, to this day still believe that. Uh, I think Jerry Fodor uh, uh, believes something like that. I haven't spoken to him recently, but I could, I could nag him and send him an email about this. But I'm pretty sure he still believes something like that. Because, well, basically, it, it satisfies uh, this intellectual urge 
to think with the computer, we've at last discovered the secret of how the brain works. By the way, it's always good to have some sense of history. Throughout history, people have fastened on the latest technology as the model of the brain. Uh, when I first got interested in this, I looked at some of the old-time uh, brain scientists, and in the 1930s, uh, the standard view was the brain is a telephone crossbar system. Guess why? That was the latest technology. If you go back to Sherrington at the end of the 19th century, the brain is a telegraph system. Well, latest technology. Before that, there were competent experts who said, the brain is a jackward loom. I don't know what a jackward loom is, but apparently it was pretty hot stuff in its era. <laughs> and if you go back uh, to Leibniz, he says, we can think of the brain as like a mill. Well, okay, keep going. There were Greeks who said, the brain is like a catapult. <laughs> well, all right, so I, I, I'm anxious to see the next technology. If you don't know how the damn thing works, you think it's, well, whatever is our latest best uh, technology, Jack Ward, Loom, uh, <laughs> a telephone crossbar system, or computer, it's always the latest technology that provides the model. Okay, so now I'm gonna say something about uh, cognitivism, I want to say more about that, and then I want to say something about connectionism, which a lot of people thought was going to rescue all this. I saw some hands up. Questions? Yes. Yeah, Marr says, now I haven't read this book recently, but so you guys should go and look it up and, and uh, see if I'm reporting Marr correctly. I'm sorry I never met Marr because he was obviously a, a marvelous, intelligent person. And he, uh, there was a whole bunch of Englishmen who died tragically very young. Most of them died from the English climate, like Frank Ramsey, uh, or they died from bad English doctors uh, like Gareth Evans. Uh, but Marr actually died at MIT, where they're supposed to have a, a, a competent doctors. Anyway, I, it was, Marr is such a sainted figure that it's regarded as bad taste to criticize him. But what the hell? Nobody's listening. I'm going to criticize him anyway. Uh, Marr's description of the task of a theory of vision uh, seems to me a, a mistaken conception of the project. He says the aim is to show how the brain converts information on a, of a two-dimensional visual array on the retina and converts that into a three-dimensional description of objects and states of affairs in the world. And then he says there are three stages that it goes through. It does what he calls the primal sketch. It makes a sketch. Uh, it gives a description, which is a sort of sketch of things. Then it does a 2.5D image. And finally, it does the full-scale 3D description of the external world. Now, that seems to me that's not what happens. That's not the nature of the project. The nature of the project is to show how this stuff that hits uh, the photoreceptor cells uh, gets uh, eventually to the point where it causes, and notice this is a causal mechanism, it causes a conscious visual experience. It's an amazing thing that it happens, but it does happen. If you didn't know anything about it, and somebody, if, if we were all blind and had no vision and somebody described it, you wouldn't understand it or it wouldn't make any sense to you, but we all know that it happens. There's this marvelous thing that happens. The light hits uh, the, uh, the photoreceptor cells, the famous rods and cones, and then uh, all hell breaks loose because it goes through the five layers of cells in the retina. It goes through the horizontal. It goes through the horizontal, bipolar, amacrine, and ganglion. How about, a, I, I think I can remember all five. Starts with a photoreceptor, it goes through, and then the ganglion cells kind of ooze into the optic nerve, and then there's that neat bit where they go over the optic chiasma, and they get to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then from there they go to V1 at the back of the skull, and there's a whole lot of feedback between a V1 and the LGN, and then the processes start going uh, forward in the brain until finally, bang, you see something. It takes uh, quite a while. I mean, it takes uh, sort of like uh, almost half a second uh, from the time the photoreceptors uh, get hit until you actually have a conscious visual experience, and this creates a lot of fascinating philosophical problems. It turns out that the batter has to start his swing 
before he actually is conscious of seeing the baseball. Why? Vision is too slow. If he waited until he consciously saw it, it would, he's already uh, gone past him. So the batter thinks that he's consciously swinging at the ball that he sees, but in fact, we know independently that he has to start the move before he's conscious of seeing the ball. Similarly, the, uh, the runner has to start moving uh, before he consciously hears uh, the gun. Because when the gun goes off, it takes too long for the sound to become conscious. He better start moving. And similarly, I mean, I go through a lot of examples of this. The good tennis player better start the swing on the serve before he consciously sees uh, the ball coming in. Uh, so the system has ways of taking things and responding to them that are quicker than consciousness. I happen to be a skier, and there are lots of moves that your body will make in skiing, uh, which are, I'm reluctant to say reflexes, because uh, mostly these guys don't know what, are, what they mean when they say a reflex, but it's certainly something that happens without you thinking about it. You just respond uh, to the environment. Your body takes over. And if you look at classic movies of uh, great downhill races, Klammer winning the Innsbruck Olympics, for example. Franz Klammer in a hell of a race, and he's going 70 miles an hour down the course, and his body is constantly making adjustments. Thanks to YouTube and Google, you can probably find Franz Klammer, uh, check it out, and you'll see that he can't consciously be aware of all the moves that his body is making. He's thinking about winning the race going fast, but the body in the meantime is making all kinds of unconscious adjustments. Okay, so well, in the course, in that sometime in this course, we're going to have to talk in detail about the relationship between uh, consciousness and behavior, uh, because the brain is actually rather slow at producing consciousness, and in all kinds of situations, your body has to respond quicker than you can become conscious of the thing you're responding to. All right. Now, anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what Mar thinks he's doing, and I'm suggesting the nature of the project is all wrong. That's not what happens. What happens is the brain produces a conscious visual experience. First you, then you. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I knew that, I'd get a Nobel Prize, if I knew the answer to that. Uh, it's not likely that, that I ever will know. Somebody else is going to figure it out. But notice that the way you put the question already presupposes a certain answer. You said the symbols. You see, symbolic. Oh, I, I don't think there's any symbolism involved until you get into the uh, later stages. Uh, at the initial stage, what you have is not a set of symbols. You have an electrochemical stimulation of a specific neurobiological structure. The eyeball is part of the brain. It's an extension of the brain. I, it's not as if it's some uh, extra movie camera you happen to have out there. And what it does is it takes in actual uh, stimuli. <laughs> it takes in actual physical events. Uh, and those physical events produce other physical events. Now, later on, you get <clears throat> enormous uh, cognitive processing, which enables you to interpret uh, degenerative uh, uh, stimuli. And I'll draw you this famous example it's due to Yastro, but Wittgenstein picked it up. Uh, now that, can, this is, as you know, this is the famous duck rabbit, and it's either a duck looking that way or a rabbit looking that way, all right? Now here are several things to notice about this dreadful beast that I've drawn on the <laughs> blackboard. One, it doesn't look the least bit like either a duck or a rabbit. If, some, if you said, I want you to bring a rabbit to the house, and somebody brought a beast that looked like that, you'd ask for your money back. Or if you go to a store to buy a duck, and they give you something that looks like no, you're not going to accept it. So it doesn't look actually like a duck or a rabbit. But your brain has this enormous capacity uh, to uh, structure degenerate data in the meaningful uh, experiences. You can have a meaningful experience. Uh, you can recognize a person just by catching a glimpse uh, of the back of their head as they go around the corner. Your brain has this incredible capacity to make meaningful data out of very limited perceptual input. And also the brain has this capacity to structure 
things beyond uh, the physics of the stimulus. So again, uh, if I draw these lines on the blackboard, uh, you will interpret that as a human face, but of course, it doesn't look at all like a human face. Again, if you saw somebody on the street that looked like that, you, <laughs> you'd call an ambulance or reach for your, your camera or something. All the same, I, you know where to put the ears. Nobody would, would put them on top of the bottom. And you know, if I say make him look unhappy, uh, you know how to do that. So uh, we do have this, and apparently there are portions of the brain that are specialized uh, for facial perception and face recognition. So we do have this remarkable capacity to take degenerate data, data that are, give you very minimal amounts of information. And again, I'm suspicious of using the word information, but let's use it here anyway. It gives you minimal amounts of information, and then the brain converts it into a meaningful experience. So there's a whole lot of cognitive components. You don't just see that as what it actually is as a bunch of lines. Another interesting thing about the duck rabbit case is that though it doesn't look at all like a duck or a rabbit, once you've seen the duck and the rabbit, it's hard to see it uh, as just a bunch of lines. You naturally will tend to it, interpret it as a duck or a rabbit. Uh, and you can't really see both at once. You, you do what is known as a gestalt switch. You switch from seeing the duck to seeing the rabbit, and then back uh, to the duck again. Okay, there was a question at the back. Yeah. Hang on. I, got, I have to get loose from my, uh, my tether here so I can get close enough to hear you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I, there are different ways of interpreting Mar, and what I'm uh, suggesting is, though, that the way that I have always interpreted him, I, it won't give us a solution to the problem of vision. I have interpreted him, and he does say words uh, uh, that suggest that this is a correct interpretation, that the task of the visual system is co to convert information about a two-dimensional visual array into a three-dimensional three description. And I think that's wrong. You don't get a description. You get conscious visual experiences. Yes? What? Well, that's why well, it's his term. I don't know what he means, but I it he seems means he means computational uh, uh, computation. the actual computational uh, results that come out at the other end. Exactly. And now the question is, how does that work? You see, because for me, that is what vision is. Consci vision is a conscious experience that occurs. I, at the end of the sequence of the that begin with a visual stimuli and go through all the, uh, the processes in the brain until it produces a conscious visual experience. Now, let me tell you that, that there are a whole lot of interesting results that challenge uh, uh, this, and one of the most fascinating is by a, a guy in Oxford, an American named Larry Weisskrantz. And a uh, Weisskrantz has, uh, well, he discovered a single patient, and now they have a whole bunch of patients. But what they have are patients that exhibit what he calls blind sight. And the blind sight occurs where the patient can become aware of, can give reports of events occurring in the patient's visual field, in the area that's open to the patient, even though the patient reports no experience of those events. And in the initial case, they have different kinds of cases now, but in the initial case, if you think of the area of your visual field as like this, it's always mi misleading, but think of it as a sort of big oval. I mean, the reason that's misleading is I can't see the edges. It drives me crazy. You try to see the top edge of your visual field, and it gets away from you. Uh, okay, now if you think, if you put a cross line like that, and you tell the guy to stare at that point, you put these crosshairs in, in, on the 
uh, on a screen in front of him, and you tell him to stare at this point, and then you flash X's and O's, and you flash those so rapidly that he can't shift his eye, and this is the area of his visual field where he's blind. These are people who've had injuries. That was a particular guy they had got run over by a car when he was 10 years old, and it damaged uh, the back of his brain. It damaged uh, v V1. Uh, so you tell the subject, what do you see? And the guy, the subjects usually become very irritated. They say, you know, I, 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 doctor, I had an injury. I can't see anything uh, if you shine it there. I, well, what does it seem like? And the guy says, well, it seemed like there's an X, or it seemed like there's an O. And then after a week of this, these X and O's, it turns out the guy is getting it right over 90% of the time. Uh, so it's not random. It's clearly not, a, 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 a statistically, a very robust result. And so what you have to postulate is the guy has a form of visual intentionality which is unconscious. The guy is unconscious of seeing anything. So he can see things occurring here and here and here normally, but here uh, it's like behind his head. It's, there, he can't see anything there, and yet he can report events occurring in the visual field. Uh, in that part of the visual field in which he is blind. And uh, this has got a name, it's called blind sight. Uh, and it is, it's now pretty well established. I mean, I think there are a whole lot of experience. Uh, uh, Petra Storig, uh, I think she should never have done this, but she did. I uh, artificially induced blind sight in monkeys by knocking a hole in their brain. Um, uh, and a guy named Cowie, I didn't know him, but Petra uh, Storig and, and uh, Cowie uh, did this with monkeys. So you can in induce blindsight artificially. Yes? Really quick, that was, uh, he doesn't have the experience of seeing the X, but he's... Yes, let me, I probably didn't say it clearly. Here's the point. You ask the guy what's there, and he can give a correct answer, even though he uh, has no visual experience. He has no awareness. He, he can't say, I now see an X, I now see an O. What does he say? He says, well, it seems sort of like there's an X there, or it seems sort of like there's an O there. Now, it's important to see when I say that this is blind, it doesn't mean that it's as if, as if the guy had his eyes closed and it was dark, but rather it's like what's behind your head. It isn't that it's dark behind my head. I don't see anything behind my head. So what the guy actually sees, his visual field, is like that. And what you do is you shine the X and the O's there. And he can, as in his words, he can guess. Uh, and the guys, they have to be prompted. You have to say, well, what does it seem like? What does it seem like? And it's in the initial stages, uh, people tend to get irritated at the doctor. Now, in the end, uh, uh, the guy who was followed by every uh, a psychology graduate student who could get near him, he became ridiculously popular. And they only had one patient for quite a while, but now they have uh, more. But in the initial innocent stage, uh, the a patient will become irritated and ask the question because he does have this serious injury that has impaired his vision. And his answer invariably is, I don't see anything. Then, now here's what's interesting, at the end of the week, they say, you got it right 95% of the time. How did you do it? And his answer was, I don't know. I couldn't see a damn thing. Uh, I think Larry quotes that by saying, I couldn't see a darn thing. It's on page 26 of Larry's book, but any, of, of Weisskranz's book, but you should have a look at that. Look at Mars' book and look at Weisskranz's uh, book on blind sight. Uh, so we're going to see more of these when I get to the part of the course which I'm more interested in, namely actual research on how the brain works and the relationship between the brain and the mind. And uh, one of the interesting things is uh, there are lots of experiments that suggest that there are forms of perceptional intentionality that do not require consciousness. So the runner who starts before he can be conscious of hearing the gun, the skier who responds before he's conscious of the irregularity in the terrain, you can't survive on it. You can't stand up on the ski slope if, you're, if your body, if you don't train your body. If your body doesn't become uh, used to doing this, making these adjustments. And then there are these pathological cases like blind sight. Uh, now, later on, 
uh, will get to the readiness potential, which a lot of people think challenges free will. And in the readiness potential, this was discovered by two Germans, Deka and Kornhuber, and then it was picked up by Ben Libet in San Francisco. And, and the, uh, uh, the point is this, in these cases, you tell a guy to do some task just whenever he feels like it. You push a button. Here's a button in front of him, and every so often push the button. But when you've actually decided to push the button, you're going to do it now, look and see where the clock is. And what you find is that the guy has an increased activity in a certain portion of the brain, an increased a neuronal activity prior to his becoming conscious that he's made up his mind to push the button. It's about uh, 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 between, I mean, it's quite a long time. It's about 300 milliseconds in Libet's experiments. And what Libet did was have a great big clock so you could see where the clock is when you uh, made up your mind to push the button. And what they found was there was an increased neuronal activity in the supplementary area prior uh, to the uh, guys becoming conscious. Now, what Libet says, and I think his data don't actually show this, but it's attempting to say this, is to say, the brain made up its mind before you were conscious. The brain decided to push the button, and the consciousness had nothing to do with it. So the picture that comes out of this, and there's a whole lot of other data like this, I think it's dead wrong, but I'm going to tell you about it later on. The picture is, look, consciousness doesn't really uh, play any meaningful role in your behavior. It goes along for the ride. The brain is busy deciding what you're going to do and what you're going to say. And then you, you, consciousness gives you the illusion uh, that you consciously decided, but you didn't. It just uh, I, that the, uh, the actual decision was made unconsciously in the brain. Uh, so I, I think these are all exciting questions. We're not going to talk about them today, but I want you to become aware of them. What we're still stuck in is the idea, well, maybe we can do a science of cognition uh, using the computational model, treating the brain as essentially a, a computer, even though there's this other stuff, even though there's consciousness and intentionality and semantics, all the same, the brain isn't a syntactical engine. Now, I made a deep challenge to that last time, and I want to spell that out a little bit more before I tell you about connectionism. Okay, more questions. I want everybody up with us. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, uh, the phenomenon I, I, is called a gestalt phenomenon. A gestalt is German for form, and the, uh, the gestalt psychologists were very influential gestalt, and they sort of ran out of gas. I don't really know what happened uh, to the gestalt psychologists, but the best guy to read on this is Steve Palmer. Palmer's written a very good book on vision. And incidentally, in, uh, in Berkeley, you get a lot of uh, uh, absolutely first-rate people working in these fields. Oh, Irving Rock was the best guy in the world on vision. He used to come to these lectures, would sit at the uh, back and keep an eye on me. Uh, and now I think Palmer is probably the, the leading theorist on vision. So look what P uh, Steve Palmer says. He's got a big book on vision. You know, it's one of these, I don't know, $80 jobs. I, I bought a copy, and I don't know where it is now. But in any case, uh, look at what he says about the Gestalt phenomena, because he's good on, on uh, subjects like that. Yeah. I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, the phenomenon that we're describing uh, is called the gestalt switch. And that is where you switch from seeing one form to seeing another. Now, there are lots of other associations that you might have with that, which are really irrelevant, I, or most part irrelevant. You, maybe you got a fear of rabbits when you're a real little child or something like that. But that's not really uh, essential uh, to this particular thing. I mean, there are lots of clinical cases like that. There was a girl, a woman, by the time she was examined, uh, who threw up whenever she heard the word date. 
Okay, well, she had obviously a bad experience. Uh, I, I, I guess we all have had experiences like that, but most of us don't throw up. Okay, but so there are all kinds of associations that people might have with particular semantic uh, content or syntactical forms. Anyway, the Gestalt switch phenomenon is important for perception, and it's important not only that you can have a constant visual stimulus which you perceive in different ways. Uh, that's the ambiguous figure. But more importantly, the brain structures degenerate data into meaningful units, into uh, uh, ways, into units that you can interpret. Okay, now I, I started to criticize this, uh, criticize cognitivism, but I'm not sure I made it so, made it clear, so let me say it a little bit more clearly. Uh, our aim in the sciences is to try to get, in the natural sciences, is to try to get an account of those features of the world that are observer independent, like force and mass and gravitational attraction. However, in the social sciences, a lot of the phenomena that, that we deal with are observer dependent. They're observer dependent in their very ontology. Uh, and there I'm thinking of things like money and property and government uh, and political parties and most important of all, language. Language is only what it is because people have uh, a certain capacities with these sounds. There's nothing in the sound as an acoustic blast, just as a, as a physical phenomenon, that makes it into a sentence of English. It's only a sentence of English if people think that is a sentence of uh, English, if only people are prepared to recognize it as a sentence of English. Okay, so you need a distinction between those phenomena that are observer relative and those phenomena that are observer independent. And roughly speaking, I said this last time, but I'll repeat it, the social sciences deal with observer relative phenomena like political parties, money, governments, I, and the natural sciences deal with observer independent phenomena like force, mass, gravitational attraction, and electromagnetism. Now then, if you ask the crucial question, what is computation? Is it observer relative or is it observer independent? Uh, that seems to me a crucial question. The idea is we're going to do a natural science of the brain. See, neuron firings are observer independent. The action of serotonin in the synaptic cleft is observer independent. These are natural phenomena in the world that don't give a damn about us. The biochemistry of the brain is all a matter of observer independent phenomena. How about computation? Is that observer relative or is it observer independent? Is it something that you could just discover in nature the way you can discover the number of carbon rings in serotonin? Well, there are computations that are observer independent, and those are computations performed by actual conscious human beings. If I add one plus one equals two, that is a computation, and I actually did it. The test is, does it matter what people think? Does it matter what other people think? And the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. I computed one plus one to get two. If some psychiatrist says, ah, yes, but there are a whole lot of other features you were unconscious of. Uh, there were secret hostilities um, being manifested in your uh, reference to a dictionary. Well, maybe so. That's a different story. I'm just talking about the actual computation that I carried out, and that was observer independent. But now, if you look at the marks on the blackboard, and you think of those marks as a computation, that's observer relative. It's only because we interpret the marks in a certain way that I, we can construe them as uh, computing the uh, arithmetical addition function uh, for two inputs, one and one, uh, to get as our output to get to the value of the addition function 
for the input one plus one is two. Uh, okay, so you have computations that are observer in the, I'll take a question in a second, uh, that are observer independent, that's where you're actually thinking about something, you're actually uh, computing something consciously, and you have uh, computations that are observer relative, and now the question is, what happens in a computer? Is the computation observer independent or is it observer relative? Once you put it that way, it seems to me the answer is obvious. It's observer relative. Intrinsically, the observer independent phenomena of the computer are it's a very complex electronic circuit. I, the computation is relative to our interpretation. Now that doesn't mean it's arbitrary. We spend a lot of money and people get university degrees and they become rich uh, by uh, inventing programs that give us a great deal of observer uh, uh, dependent power uh, over the hardware. The hardware is all observer independent. The hardware is, I, I, I like to use the word intrinsic because it offends people. It sounds like there's something mystical or mysterious. Uh, the hardware has intrinsic features, and those intrinsic features enable us to give a computational interpretation. But the upshot is that with these very few exceptions, such as where you're consciously carrying out a computation, computation does not name an observer independent feature of reality. Computation is observer relative. Now again, that doesn't mean it's arbitrary. Being a knife is observer relative because this a, a bunch of metal is a knife only because that's what we designed it for and we use it for. If we only did these things for paperweights, uh, then uh, they would be paperweights and not knives. So being a knife and, and in general performing a function is observer relative. But computation does not name a natural phenomenon like force, mass, gravitational attraction, photosynthesis, or digestion. So the, the, the bottom line of this discussion is you can't discover that the brain is a digital computer. You can only interpret it as a digital computer. So the question that we began with, is the brain a digital computer, is ambiguous. If it asks, is the brain a digital computer in the sense that we can interpret its, its operations computationally? The answer is everything is a digital computer in that sense. If I drop this piece of chalk, I can show you that it's computing a certain function, S equals one half GT squared. So if the question, is the brain a digital computer, means can we give a computational interpretation to the operation of the brain, the answer is you can give a computational interpretation to everything. Every, anything that admits of a systematic description will admit of a computational interpretation. You can construe it as going from one computational state to another. But if you say, no, that wasn't the question we were asking, is the brain intrinsically a digital computer? In a way that intrinsically has neurons, does it intrinsically compute? And the answer is nothing is a digital computer in that sense, except conscious processes of actually doing things like addition and subtraction. So the problem with the uh, uh, computational AI theory of the mind is not that it's false. AI was a, a strong AI was at least false. It's incoherent. It hasn't got a well-defined question. If the question is, is the brain intrinsically a digital computer? The answer is nothing is intrinsically a digital computer. It's always relative to an interpretation. If the question is, well, can you interpret it computationally? The answer is you can interpret anything computationally. It's trivial. So the, question, so the idea that we're going to discover that the brain is really a digital computer, that's an incoherent project because the, the question is ill-defined. Now that still leaves open an interesting question. How far can you get by interpreting the operations of the brain computationally? What has happened is a wonderful thing, uh, and I argued for it for a long time, but it wasn't my arguments that made it happen. It was improvements in the science. What happened is this. We've moved away from computational cognitive science to cognitive neuroscience. This is happening as we sit here. Uh, the thing that excites the people over there in Tolman is that big magnet that sits in the ugly building out in front. Uh, the magnet is called the magnetic resonance imaging, and the process is fMRI. 
Now, again, we always make the same mistake. Every new technology uh, gives people the idea, at last, we're going to know how the brain works because we've got PET scans, CAT scans, uh, 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 EEG, all this kind of stuff goes back to my childhood. And the latest now is fMRI, where you can do functional magnetic resonance imaging, and you actually give uh, the guy a question, and you can see which parts of the brain light up. Uh, but in any case, though, I think there are limitations uh, to the technology. So, uh, cognitive science, as we sit here, is moving away from computational cognitive science to cognitive neuroscience, and I welcome that. I think that's exactly the right way to go. Now, it's harder. Uh, we don't know how the uh, brain uh, works. And uh, I, the, the most interesting question, how does the brain produce consciousness? Well, we're not there yet. We don't know how the brain produces consciousness. We know it happens, uh, and we think the thalamocortical system plays a special role. But how exactly does it work? We don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, OK, so my objection to uh, cognitivism, uh, to the uh, weak AI version of the computational theory of the mind, is that as it stands, it's not a well-defined empirical hypothesis because they treat computation as if it named a natural phenomenon like force, mass, or gravitational attraction, or photosynthesis, or, or digestion. It doesn't. It names an observer relative phenomenon. Computation is, in the, is relative to the observer. Now, you might still get a useful computational cognitive science. The progress has been very slow. It doesn't seem to me to be getting anywhere, but it does not I uh, meet the conditions that people originally thought, namely, we've discovered that the brain is a digital computer and, and uh, mental states are syntactical states and mental processes are uh, processes operating over the formal, symbolic, syntactical structure of the mental states. That project, as I just described it, is incoherent. However, connectionism, let's now go on to what was going to be the great uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the great breakthrough, connectionism, sometimes called parallel distributed processing, or PDP. Um, neuronal net modeling was another name for it. Okay, uh, questions. I, I promise to stop for questions. First you, then you. Or maybe you were first. I think you were first. Yeah, I think you've been trying to ask a question. Go ahead. It's back to like the observer independent and observer relative stuff. Did you, did you say that both saying one plus one equals two is observer relative yeah. and it's a, it's a bit tricky. Let me state it precisely. If I think 1 plus 1 equals 2, that's observer independent. If, no matter what anybody else thinks, they think, well, Searle's really thinking about uh, the wine that he wants to drink. No, I'm thinking about 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's observer independent. That's up to me. It doesn't matter what any observer says. The sentence that I wrote on the blackboard, 1 plus 1 equals 2, only means that 1 plus 1 equals 2 relative to the conventions of mathematical, arithmetical uh, 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 notation. So the fact that the sentence can be used to perform that computation, that's observer relative. The actual computation when performed by a conscious agent is observer independent. And this is generally the case. If I say in English, it's raining, uh, that is intrinsic to me. That is, I actually said it. But the fact that the sentence means what it does, that's observer relative. I could have said the same thing by saying, es regnet, or il pleut. Go ahead. Crucial question. Yeah. Is it, is it more like a question about languages? No, it's a question about the relationship between human interpretation and reality. See, here is our situation. Uh, we are very limited animal agents trying to understand how the world works. Uh, we have we lucked out in one respect. We got more neurons than you need for a hunter-gatherer existence. We got surplus neurons. Uh, we got lots of surplus. We, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, when I was a child, it was told a male, uh, uh, males produce enough uh, sperm to repopulate the world. I think they're exaggerating, or maybe the world population is getting ahead of us. But the point is, uh, evolution is, is uh, uh, not economical, and it gave us more neurons than we need for hunter-gatherer uh, environments. Now, we all evolved for hunter, uh, as hunter-gatherers, uh, and indeed, apparently, <laughs> Our gene pool, our, our genetic endowment, hasn't changed in the past 30,000 
years. We're still uh, in the genetic basis of the hunter-gatherer environment. But uh, we have surplus neurons that enable us to do all this other stuff that we do, and in particular, uh, the stuff that you can do if you've got a language. So we create not only money, property, government, and marriage, but universities, scientific laboratories, research institutes, uh, and, and philosophy uh, departments, and they produce books and articles. All right, now, in order to understand how the world works, we've got to make a crucial distinction between those features of the world that are what they are, regardless of us, and don't give a damn about us. That's what I'm calling observer independent. Incidentally, this seems to me absolutely essential for understanding reality, what I'm now saying. And we have to distinguish between that and features that do depend on us, like money, property, government, marriage, and language. All of those are observer relative. Okay, now when we make a discovery, you have to ask yourself, are we discovering something whose very existence is observer relative or whose existence is observer independent? That's very important for understanding its scientific status. Now that doesn't mean you can't have objective truths about observer relative phenomena. When we were just trying to decipher the Mayan hieroglyphs, uh, what you've got are a bunch of marks on stones. Or take a case where we had a, a signal success, where, we, uh, uh, where Michael Ventris figured out how to decipher linear B. Linear B was a bunch of marks on stones that people had discovered. They didn't know what the hell it was. And this English amateur, the English loved that because it was done not by some damn professor, but it was done by an amateur. Uh, Michael Ventris figured out it was Greek. And that was a discovery. Though what he discovered was an observer relative phenomenon, namely that these marks were marks in the Greek language. So the fact that it's observer relative doesn't mean that anything goes or it's all arbitrary, you can't have a science, but it does mean in this case that the, the idea that you would, might discover that the brain is a digital computer is not a case of a natural science discovery. What you're discovering is that you can interpret it computationally, I, uh, and, but then the problem with that is you can interpret anything computationally. So now the, the, the problem isn't solved, the problem is only posed when you say, well, how useful is this interpretation? I'm sorry it was such a long-winded answer, but anyway, it's a deep question, and I think uh, it, uh, it was important to make it clear. Uh, now there was another guy who had a question. Yeah, same question, okay. So how are we doing, yeah? That's right, yeah. That's observer independent. That's intrinsic. That's part of the real world. Yeah, okay. No, that's, yeah, now everybody wants all philosophical questions. All want, that is a deep question in the philosophy of mathematics. We're not going to talk about that this morning. Okay. I only got one, only solve one question at a time. What is the nature of mathematical truth? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I, 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 this is a course in the philosophy of mind. Okay. May I put that one off? But don't forget it. I mean, it's a beautiful question, and we ought to, I, I ought to face up to it at some point. Okay. <laughs> Well, what time is it? Uh, okay, uh, uh, connectionism. I dread talking about connectionism, and I put it off so there's hardly any time, but let me talk about it. If you think of the brain as a digital computer, you have a real problem, and that is the kind of computer that you own has an electronic system that enables it to work very rapidly. I keep saying over and over, several million computations per second. I don't know if I believe that, but it's, they all say that, so what the hell, I'll say it too. Okay, but the brain can't do that. It can't work that fast. The brain is very slow, and it does this neuron fires and the next neuron fires. Uh, now, if you try to do it to make the brain work the way that your computer works, it couldn't solve the problems rapidly enough. So if you think of how long it takes you 
to recognize a human face. You see a, a face of a friend of yours. How long does it take you to recognize it? Well, it takes about half a second, or as we uh, tough-minded professionals say, 500 milliseconds. OK, it means the same as half a second. But anyway, it sounds like you know, the guy actually got some education somewhere. Uh, OK, all right, so it takes 500 milliseconds. Now, the problem is, if you think of how the brain processes, it can't do enough steps in 500 milliseconds. And there's a famous argument that's called the 100-step argument. In the case of most cognitive achievements, you recognize a face. I, I, you reach in your pocket and feel, yes, those are my car keys. I, or you understand a sentence that somebody uttered. If the computational processes were linear, processes, if they were uh, the sorts of processes that you get in, uh, in the computers that you buy in a store, then you couldn't do them because you only have time for 100 steps. And any programmer will tell you that 100 steps of programming language just it doesn't give you enough. It's too slow. Uh, so this is called a 100-step argument. Uh, and it says in, in 100 steps, of a, a traditional von Neumann machine, of a traditional linear digital computer, I, 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 you can't do enough computing to actually solve the problems that you want to solve. So how does the brain do it? Well, the idea is the brain does not do linear computation. It does not do uh, one step followed by the next step followed by the next step, but it does a whole lot of steps operating simultaneously and in parallel and interactive with each other. So the actual pictures uh, that they draw in the textbooks or on the blackboards look like this. You have a series of nodes, and then you have on the input side and on the output side, you have a series of nodes, and then you have an intermediate series of nodes, and indeed you have a whole bunch of intermediate series of nodes, and those are called hidden layers. So we'll suppose the bottom one here is the input layer. The signal comes in, and the signal comes in to each one of the nodes in the layers. Now then, each node is connected to every node in the next layer, and then so on with all of the other layers. Each layer has connections to all of the other nodes. That means that when each of these reaches, each of these uh, gets a signal, it then sends the signal to the next layer, but the signal goes on with a whole lot of other signals from the other nodes, and they're all interacting with each other simultaneously. So the processing is, you see, if I drew you a picture of a standard digital computer, it goes like that, step, 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 step. This one has a whole lot of layers, and each layer has a set of nodes, and those uh, nodes convey a signal to the next layer in line to the nodes of the, of the next layer. Now, the key element here is that there are what is known as connection strengths. So this, we'll, we'll suppose that this takes in a symbol whose value is one, uh, and this has a connection strength of one half, so this multiplies one half by one, and this particular node sends a, a signal of value of one half to the next node in line, and so on with each I of the connections between this node and the nodes in the next layer. They're a set of numerical values that are taken in, and then the numerical values go to the next node in line by being converted from the initial value times the connection strength. The connection strength affects uh, the value of the, in, of, the, of the signal that is sent to the next node in line. So this node here will do a, su a summation of all of the values from these four nodes that it's connected to. Now you're supposed to think, well, the brain has zillions of these. This is, well, I'm just showing you a sort of Mickey Mouse model of the connection of the system in the brain. So you have a series of input signals. And the input signals uh, 
uh, reach uh, the nodes, uh, there's a certain value to the input signal, and then the connection strengths, the connection between one uh, node and the next node will then determine the value that's actually communicated to the next node. Now the picture you're supposed to have in mind is, it's just like neurons. See, the, the neuron takes in the, uh, the uh, signals uh, from the dendrites, and then it does a calculation in the soma, it does a calculation in the cell nucleus as to what it's supposed to send out, and then when it fires, it sends out a signal to the next node in line. So the picture is the, the, the hidden agenda here is we're not supposed to think of these as just a, a, a set of signals that we have uh, in an electronic circuit that we happen to have in Tolman Hall, uh, but rather it's just like the brain. And the brain operates in parallel. And we know from the hundred step argument that the brain has to operate in parallel because it isn't fast enough to do things like uh, recognize a face uh, or, or uh, reach for the gear shift uh, or put on the brakes or, do, or understand a sentence, which are all the things that you have to do in real life. It isn't fast enough to do those if it had to do one step followed by another step followed by another step. It's so the brain is a parallel distributed processing system and these networks are sometimes called connectionist networks. And when, <clears throat> I'll never forget when the, uh, when the book was originally published, there was a book by three authors, uh, Rommel Hart, McClellan, and I forget the third guy's name, but he's immortalized anyway, so okay. And, and the idea was, uh, already people were getting dismayed about traditional artificial intelligence, a very simple reason, it wasn't getting anywhere. Uh, and the idea was that with PDP, we've now got a breakthrough. The 100-step argument proves that this has to be right. Uh, so the computational model of the mind gave us parallel distributed processing as the next great technological breakthrough. Uh, we were to see that we can keep the computer model of the mind, but you don't have to think of the mind as a linear digital computer. You can think of the brain uh, as a parallel distributed system and the programming that is done. And programmers tell me that programming a PDP system is just quite different from programming a regular computer. It really is uh, a, a different sort of a process. And so you have this parallel distributed processing going on. Now, in the early days of this, uh, we couldn't afford to buy a parallel uh, computer in the Cognitive Science Group in Berkeley, so we, we used to run it through a regular uh, uh, computer, and what you do is you have to compute each of these separately. You do all of this in line. You don't do it simultaneously. You compute each step separately, and we set the computer at uh, 2 in the morning and let it run all night, and then we'd have a whole lot of zeros and ones that got printed out in the morning. I gave a lecture to the Air Force about artificial intelligence, and I said, well, we, we can't afford a parallel uh, computer in Berkeley, so we just use a regular VAC 750. We use a regular computer. And these guys thought, can't afford it. It's dirt cheap. We get them for a couple million. Uh, they didn't realize that in the cognitive science group, $2 million sounded like a lot of money. In the Air Force, you know, that's nothing. That costs that every time they blow their nose. Uh, okay, uh, it's, it's now time.